Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very special edition of Arambe. Tonight, we feature Dr. John Henry Clark, the Dean of All African American Historians. And with me to tell us all about it is the man to put this very special piece together. I'm talking about my right arm, associate producer, Byron Crudup. Byron, why don't you share with our viewers exactly what Dr. John Henry Clark is all about? Well, Chuck, you know, it's very hard to summarize just how eminent an individual Dr. John Henry Clark is. Uh, he is mentor to people such as Dr. Malifia Santi at Temple. Uh, he was a mentor to Malcolm X. He's an authority on Marcus Garvey. He's written several books, Malcolm X, The Man and His Ideas. He's written books on Garvey. Uh, one thing that you have to remember in this interview is that the man is blind. He's getting on in years. He's approaching his 80s. And so we have to understand that, but I think that in spite of that, you'll get the message loud and clear that this man is very eminent. He has a powerful message, and I think that you'll enjoy the show immensely. Dr. Clark, in view of the present world situation where the U.S. is in a position of being world policeman, if you will, how do you see the progress of what is commonly referred to as Pan-Africanism developing into the next century? I think uh, in the light of the attempt to recolonize Africa and to control the media and the African mind, Pan-Africanism is going to become more essential than ever and more people are going to understand it. Pan-Africanism is no different from pan-Europeanism. Pan movements have existed all over the world, but no one gets overly excited about them until we began to, uh, to produce these movements. I see no solution for African people except some form of pan-Africanism and African nationalism. I think Africans throughout the whole world will have to come together as African people and march into the arena of power in the world and speak with a single voice. I see no other solution. You have written extensively on the subject of cultural colonialism versus physical colonialism as it relates to Africa and African peoples around the world. Could you expound on that concept? I think the best way to understand the subject is to at least talk away from the subject for a minute. Because for the last 500 years, this world has been ruled by European nationalism. And Europe has had one concept, and that concept is European dominance. It would be European dominance under the name of communism or socialism, under the name of fascism or capitalism, under the name of Christianity, but it, European dominance. And we have to realize that we live in a European-conceived intellectual universe. I'm not advocating this for African people. I'm saying that African people need to claim all those things in the world that belongs to them and that we can do this without destroying another people's culture, destroying another people's country, or taking the people out of history. We can do this without doing to other people all the cruel and tragic things that has been done to us. What can we do? as African Americans to expedite progress towards a better understanding of and mutual cooperation with African peoples worldwide? We as African Americans are, are trying to improve the human relationship of African people worldwide and we're also trying to get the various fragments of African people to understand each other those in the Caribbean island, those in South America, and, and those here in the United States, those in the Pacific, and those in Africa itself. We're trying to get across the, the, point, the point that we were never a minority, and that if you count all of us on the face of the earth, we number over a billion people. And once you get a billion people together, they're not going to have to worry about who's going to be their allies so long as they become allies to themselves. They have to expand Pan-Africanism beyond its narrow base to a concept of an African world union. What is your opinion about present African-American leadership in terms of direction, goals, and achievement made over the last 20 or, say, 30 years? 
African Americans, unfortunately and tragically, have more leaders and less leadership than any people in the whole of the African world. And a lot of the people who are pretending leadership are charlatans and, um, and, and pretenders. And yet among them, there has emerged some very able men worthy of the mantle of leadership. And because of the pretenders, they've gotten less attention than, than they deserve. I think uh, our leaders in general misunderstand their mission. If you're the leaders of a people, then you have to get a mandate from the people. And if the people ask you, leader, where are you leading me? You must have a good answer for them. Not only where are you leading me, who are you leading me to? Who are you leading me for? The true leader must be a messenger delivering a message for the people and not uh, a charlatan imposing a message on the people. And that the leader that ignores this is not worthy of the name leader. Dr. Clark, you have extensive knowledge of Malcolm X. Did you know him personally? And if so, could you share some of your thoughts about him and his impact on this country, Africa, and the world in general? I knew Malcolm X personally. I met him in 1958 uh, when I was uh, director of the African Heritage um, Expedition. And he was one of the uh, exhibitors. Of, well, the Nation of Islam was one of the exhibitors. And we were friends until his um, untimely death. He had a number of people that he related to who were not Muslims who furnished him information. And this is really what made him so sharp. And I was in the shallow cabinet furnishing him information on, on history. He was one of the fastest learners I've ever met in my life. I would have loved to have had him in a classroom. He would have gotten straight A's plus because in addition to having a good memory, he has an excellent analytical mind. I think his loss was one of the great losses of leadership that the African American has sustained in this century because I think he was the finest example of a leadership, of a leader to emerge directly from the uh, working class of African Americans as against the uh, pseudo middle class where most of the leaders generally emerge. Could you describe the differences between Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King from a personal and political perspective, and how each impacted on the civil rights movement? Malcolm X and Dr. King was going in the same direction down different roads. They were not as much in conflict as most people would like for you to believe. There's nothing King advocated and nothing Malcolm advocated that was in conflict one to the other. They just advocated in different ways and advocated in more, more explicitly. Malcolm X was more rooted in the community and the people and King was rooted into a, a class who came to teach the lowly. Malcolm was rooted in a class and that he was a part of the lowly. And that he, has, he had risen from the Maya to be a man of substance. And he was trying to give them at least the impression that they could do the same. Martin Luther King was doing the same thing in a different way. The political impact was different because America would buy King's message as an alternative from the radical Malcolm. They both had tremendous political impact on this country. Malcolm had more impact abroad. Martin Luther King had, and the civil rights movement was better known 
But you could hear King's speech. It had substance. It had beauty. But you couldn't whistle the next day. You could hear Malcolm X's speech, and you can set it to music the next day. The simplicity of a Malcolm X coming from the common area of his people, but never losing the touch, and yet being as high as an aristocrat. He could speak to an audience. The scholar would understand. The layman would understand. And neither one would feel that they'd been talked down to. He was probably one of the great imaginative orators of this time, as King was one of the great theoreticians, theologians of the time in which he lived. Both men were great in their own way, and we should stop putting one against the other, as we should stop putting Du Bois against Booker T. Washington and Du Bois against Mark, uh, Marcus Garvey. We keep looking for contests, and we quite forget that sometimes two different men can be saying the same thing uh, using different words. And till we look at Malcolm and King in this manner and stop assuming that there was a fight between them, I don't think we have done justice to them or looked at either one of them correctly. And along the same lines, Dr. Clark, um, it's also said that Malcolm and Martin met only once. <laughs> Understanding that each had different philosophies on how to gain human rights, was there a tacit mutual cooperation between the two? There was a tacit mutual understanding between the two. They didn't have enough time together to affect anything called cooperation. But they knew in each other's presence they were not in an armed camp. And each one had a respect for the energy and the direction of the other. I think this nation feared the coming together of these two men because they not only could have changed their own people around, they would have changed this nation around. I think in many ways, this might be one of the many causes both of them were killed. We will never know why they were going because both of them were cut down while they were still growing. We make an assessment of King and Malcolm. Remember, the, uh, the door is ajar. We can't close the door on it because they didn't finish the mission, and we can't finish the story. Yes. How do you feel that we as black people can best infuse Afrocentricity into our youth's educational experience? Until we look at the historical definition of African consciousness and African awareness, we'll be missing the point. When we look at 19th century African centricity, the colonization, the African colonization movement, the Negro Convention movement, look at William Wells Brown, our first novelist who wrote a book on Ethiopia, look at Ma Delaney in the middle of the 19th century, Robert Campbell, look at the beginning of the black newspapers when we said so we reserve the right to speak for ourselves, look at the settlement of Liberia, look at the, the, the three of the many slave revolts, Gabriel Prosser, 1800, uh, Denmark Visa, 1822, and Nat Turner, 1831. When we look at the underpinnings of these slave revolts, all of it was to regain what slavery and colonialism had taken away. And so, uh, until we look at the, the 19th century origins of what we're talking about as Afrocentricity, we can't understand the 20th century origin. We have to have a holistic view of this in order to have a specific view of it. I think we're too skimpy in our analysis of what we are talking about. But we have a generation that will not do any research, will not do any in-depth reading. The answer is there if we apply ourselves in finding the answer. With all the evidence supporting the contribution of Africans to world history, why do you think that it is so difficult for the powers that be to view the African contribution 
to history as legitimate. If you show the African contribution to the history of the world, including Egypt, Ethiopia, Cush, and the biblical lands that you meet, that's a contradiction. You cannot say an inferior people created this. You cannot say an inferior people created the pyramids. You cannot say an inferior people created the Niger Valley civilization. You cannot say an inferior people uh, brought into being independent states one after the other for over a thousand years before the slave trade. You cannot point out the two Africans, Zaid bin Hadid and Bilal, who helped to create Islam, mm -hmm. you point all of this out, then you have to withdraw this nonsense about people being inferior. Then you have to say that if they are, have the same mentality, good and bad, if they played every role in human history from saint to baffoon, like every other people, then I do not have the right to deny them entry to a medical school to a school of engineering, to a school of oceanography. And I do not ha have the right to tell them that their mind is different from any other mind, that I must release their aspirations and let them come to the marketplace of ideas and do their purchasing and do their solicitation to control the world, mm -hmm. then he's your equal. If you accept him as your equal, you cannot in turn oppress him unless you would also oppress, oppress your mother and your sister and your father. Understanding that it has been historically difficult to infuse the Afrocentric or African-centric concept into the public school systems, how important is it for our youth, and all youth for that matter, to know and understand African culture, and how best can we facilitate educating our youth through alternative means? First, we have to stop dealing with illusions. We cannot ask the people who programmed us into oblivion to program, uh, to program us out of it. So far as I'm concerned, education has but one honorable purpose, one alone, everything else is nonsense. And that is to train the student to be a respectful and a responsible handler of power. People do not train you in how to take their power away from them when they hold power by controlling you. To expect this of other people is a contradiction in terms. Freedom is something you do not wish upon, you do not dream upon. Mm -hmm. Freedom is something you take with your own hands. It is never secure until you take it with your own hands. Mm -hmm. You do not leave it for another generation. Each generation must in turn secure it with their own hands, even if you leave it to them in a will. It is not secure until they make it secure with their own hands, their own bodies, and their own minds. And so long as we avoid this reality, someone else is going to dictate the content of education. And when people dictate the content of education, they're dictating what goes into your mind. And when they dictate that, they're going to dictate agitation. They're going to dictate your action. And though you might lie about it, so long as you are in this position, you are some form of a slave. And it is incumbent upon you to free yourselves from it. You educate yourself to come out of it and do not expect others to do it for you. We stop begging at the door of people who reduced us to beggars. With hip-hop and rap music being the rage today among our young people, do you see harm in the lyrics? Do you see any redeeming value in the messages being given our youth through this medium? There's positive rap and there's negative rap. 
I think some of the negative rap are just downright vulgar mm -hmm. and should be thrown into the ash can. Yes. I think if those who are doing positive rap knew a little more about history, mm. they could be even more positive. Yes. I used to put my kids to bed, you know, and, and I would sing, make up songs about African kings. And, you know, tell them the story of Shamo Belongongo, who ruled the old Congo. Shamo Belongongo, king of the old Congo. Now you go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. <laughs> I mean, so, I me, mean, you don't have to make a big lesson plan out of it. Uh -huh. You can make some fun out of it. I see. That's very good. What is your response to the notion shared by many that Africa never had a written language? Well, my response is to do some research and find out what written language they did have, and I've done that. So I've repudiated it and don't have a great deal to say about it other than the fact that it's a lie. And if you say Africa didn't have a real language, now you're saying hieroglyphics are not African. Then if it didn't, not African, then who it belonged to? Europeans did not even understand it until the end of the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So it surely didn't belong to them mm -hmm. until Champollion decoded it. They didn't even know what the ancient Egyptians were talking about. So they couldn't have created it if they didn't know it. Mm -hmm. So that's it. When we talk about African language, let's start right there. Then let's look at the Vi language, still in existence. Let's look at the Songhe script. Uh, Rosalind Jeffries, uh, Professor Jeffries' wife, have located 20 different, 20 different African alphabetical systems. Still in, in existence. And um, a, a lady, uh, Claudia Solosky, had written a book called African Accounts, tracing African mathematical, mathematical methods. There's no shortage of information. We need not keep repeating these old cliches. A lot has been said about the contributions of Hippocrates. Can you tell us a little bit about Imhotep and some of the institutions of the time? One of the main reasons we get a lot of, lot of nonsense about Hippocrates is because we haven't even read what he said. Read what Hippocrates said. Mm -hmm. He said, I am a child of Imhotep. He was beholden to this African who lived nearly 2,000 years before he was born. He worshiped at the shrine of Imhotep. And Imhotep was the world's first multi-genius. He was a scientist. He was a priest. He was the world's first physician. He gathered the intellects of his day around him that became the embryo of what later would be the great lodge that the um, Greeks called Luxor. <coughs> Other Greeks called Thebes, the Arabs called Luxor, the Africans called Warat. This would be the world's beginning of higher learning. This is the embryo that's going to go into the making of the university. This man helped set this in motion. Give him his proper place in history. I'm not saying take uh, uh, Hippocrates out of history. I said place him in history in his, in his proper place. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying take George Washington out of history. I said let's take George Washington out of history and show his relationship with several black people who saved his life. Mm -hmm. Leave him in history. Mm -hmm. But show how we related to him. Homer. Herodotus and others have written extensively about the wealth and culture of Africa. Why do you think that it is so difficult to find these writings and why they aren't publicized as much as other more Western works? Because their writings repudiate the concept about the African savage with no culture. Because in Homer, you see mysterious Africans sometimes 10 feet tall with one eye in the middle. These are stereotypes, but they're complementary stereotypes. In Homer, you see the Greeks, anytime they're under attack, 
they would tell their enemy, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to tell my friends the Ethiopians. That means they had so much respect for the Ethiopians. They knew the Ethiopians could get people off of their back. Mm -hmm. And they referred to the Ethiopian as the blameless people, the favorites of the gods. Mm -hmm. In fact, the word Ethiopia itself came, comes out of Greek mythology. Now, one of the reasons they don't want to recognize Herodotus is because Herodotus is called the father of history. And, and Herodotus established in his own writings, because he was an eyewitness, mm -hmm. the culture of Egypt. He came to Egypt when it was in decline and ruins. And he said that Egypt, under that state, had more to offer than a young and confused Greece trying to learn the rudiments of civilization. Do you think why you go, going to buy the Greek stuff and buy that too? Mm -hmm. You can't buy the Greek myth, buy the Greek creed civilization when the world was here before the Greeks, culture before the Greeks. And the Greeks had no preachable culture, had no fraternities until they came in contact with African secret societies. Mm -hmm. One admission forces another admission so that you can't even make the first one, else you have to make several more. You spoke about religion before and uh, your background as a Baptist. Uh, what, do you have a religion now? Or? No, I don't need a religion. Okay. I need a spiritual belief system I as see. part of my life. Okay. I have that. I'm satisfied with that. Okay. I can go to any church I feel like. Mm -hmm. I was in church last night, and what shocked and disturbed me was the mutualization of the spirituals. I see. People got all kind of doodads and fancy, yeah, 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 yeah. that's not saying God. Mm-hmm. You sing the words, you put some spirit into it. Yes. You don't just lift your voice just to get applause. Mm -hmm. You lift your voice because that's the correct way to do it. Mm -hmm. And you know it because that's the correct way. Haven't they ever heard of Mahalia Jackson? I, said, I, I, I turned to my partner then, uh, last night and I said, it's a pity faith sent us only one Mahalia Jackson. Mm -hmm. Yes. So there's only one Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. Only one Du Bois. Yes. Mm -hmm. If faith sends you somebody of substance, you don't make the best use of it. Faith don't send you another one. Mm -hmm. People, say, People ask me, so what, do you think we'll ever have another Malcolm X? I said, what the hell did you do with the first one? Mm -hmm. You let the first one be killed right in front of your eyes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you deserve another one? Right.